Have you ever wanted to get involved in real estate development but didn't know where to begin? Do you think real estate development is only for the large hedge funds or major corporations, you know, the big guys? Or have you done some development in the past and are looking to scale up? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Wired Wealth and Real Estate Development Podcast. I am your host, Nick Smith. Get ready to have your mind blown and rewired as we discuss all aspects of creating wealth and real estate development. One thing that I've learned, and I just listened to an audio book toward the end of last year uh, mm-hmm. called Who Not How. Ooh. And a lot of times when we get an idea, we focus on the how. Right. When we really should be focusing on the who. Yeah. yeah. And, and I tell people that, you know, there are a lot of people that have desires of doing real estate development, but doing it differently, not just for a what can I gain from it right. mindset, but how can I genuinely make the community better? How can I help some of those single mothers, right. you know, with children? How can you help people with homelessness? There are a lot of people that have those desires and you're trying to figure out the how right. when you really should be finding out the who. Right. Exactly. <laughs> because there's somebody out there that has complementary skills or that mm-hmm. are doing some of the things or you can align with. Yeah. And, and and I think that's crucial for community organization and community partners. You know, I, I agree. In fact, I think that I'm sitting with a who. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just kind of interesting because, you know, I've known you now for many, many years, but really I, I knew more of as just a neighbor to my son, you know, and as we walked through everything, one day you call me up and I had no idea you're the who that I needed to <laughs> get this thing going in a greater way. And I think that's, to me, that's the real connection. There's this, there's this statement that's always made and sometimes people look at it as a negative, but I think it's a positive where you got to know someone, right. you know, it's who you know, right? Right. right. But, you know, I always, people say, well, you know, yeah, you're, now you're just being political or now you're trying to, you know, just working all your contacts or whatever. But you have to know somebody to get into heaven. Right. <laughs> you know? right. So, you know, when we go up there and we, we face the, you know, face God, if, if, if Jesus doesn't come along and say, yep, I know him, <laughs> then we're not getting through the fir- first door, you know, <laughs> yeah. type of thing. At least in my theology, the way that works. And the same way as what you say is it's not how, it's who. I think is the biggest, is a huge component on that. That took me a while to know because I, that's great in verbiage. Right. Right. Application. But the application <laughs> is a lot, is, is really, it's, it's crucial. I do believe that there is some level of how you need to know in the, some of that stuff, especially when you're investing in relationships with people is that you, you know enough about the what you're doing, what you're getting a part of, to at least know that they know what they're talking about, you know, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's that's probably one of the little things, but I would find myself spending hours and hours and hours on what it meant to be a developer or what it meant to, you know, build this or do that. And I think I was on a I was on a phone call with, with some of our developers and and they brought out one little component, one thought, and I'm like See, that's why I get with you guys, because you're smarter than me. And, and the guy on the other line, his name's Tony, he says to me, he goes, it's not that we're smart, we just have more experience. We've just been doing this a long time. And I think that's the big thing about it for each one of us, is when you get something in your heart that's so deep and so transforming, like, you know, the man in the tree, for me, it will keep you going. It's like I said, I, I don't want to move away from that very far. There was an experience that happened to me probably about 10 years later after that, maybe 15. And I was driving down the road that the the church is on, and all of a sudden, I turned on the corner, and it was early in the morning, probably 7.30 or 8, and there was probably anywhere from five to 7,000 people sitting on the entire, uh, with the street, the big parking lot that we have right next to us, the area career center that was there, Hmm. the, the civic center, everything. And I couldn't hardly even get through the through through the uh, street. There was so many people, and it was so early. 
I had no idea why. So I was driving down. Finally, I, I pulled in. I finally got into the parking lot. And at one moment, I finally, I just parked in there. And I went over to one of the traffic policemen that was there. Uh, and I said, what is going on here? What is the, what is the deal? Well, about three weeks before that, we had a man that was a very good friend of ours, and he was telling me a story about about water and uh, digging wells. And in Africa, the water supply is so limited that they were that people will die of of thirst until somebody comes in and digs a well, but they don't have the ability to go down deep enough to get fresh water. And so we were part of a group that was able to go in and build and and pay for these wells. It would be like it was maybe five thousand dollars. It wasn't very much at all. So we jumped on board with this and helped. And and he says, what we do now is now wherever that well is is where everybody congregates. And now we're able to walk in and we're giving them fresh water. And you know, of course, the the biblical or spiritual analogies of fresh water and bringing people together was amazing. Well, I'd had that mind in mind. So I give, I was asking God again. I was going, God, what's our well? Give me a well. W- what is a well that we can have that will gather people around us that we can be able to help in their lives and pour into their you know, lives and their families and, and present you to them as well as getting from, from surviving to thriving and everything else. And this was before any of this had all happened. And I said to he said, so... We walk in, and, and the man says to me, the police officer says to me, well, they just opened up Section 8 again. Wow. I said, what? And I didn't know, I didn't understand any of that, okay? And so I said, they opened up what? And they said, he, they opened up Section 8 for uh, applications. I said, you mean to tell me every one of these people that are here wow. need housing? And he goes, evidently, because they're all here to apply for Section 8. Nick, through the course of that week, they finally had to move that whole thing over to the camp, college campus near us because there were so many people. They estimated anywhere from twenty to 30,000 people wanted to come in because Section 8 hadn't been opened up in so long that they did not have any resources to be able to get any kind of housing. And that's what was, and immediately I just heard inside of me, there's your well. There was the housing. And so for me personally, now we have all kinds of other, we have feeding programs, we have, you know, where we give groceries, we have after school programs, daycares, all of that for, but for me, but the driving force for me was always the housing. If I can help provide somebody a house, that's like providing a well, that brings in the whole family and that family will gather around that home. They'll gather around that shelter, whatever the case might be, and they'll come in and then we're able to build a relationship with them. Wow. Well, that is a mesmerizing story. And Section 8, a lot of people criticize the Section 8 program. Yeah, they do. And, you know, I definitely think it could be improved, but not everybody that is on Section 8 is a bad person. Mm -mm. Not everybody that's on Section 8 is looking for a handout. Right. And and we have to take it, you know, with a grain of salt, you know, because it is a, the program is meant to truly assist people and help people that really do need it. Well, and I think that that's something that I've even worked with in my own Thinking this through, whether it's, you know, I'm kind of working on a theology of missions with, with, with the focus on housing. So you almost, it's not a theology of housing would per se, but it's something along those lines is, is, you know, the programs that we have, whether it's the section 42 that helped build the, you know, the, the development that's right by us that we were a part of, or it's home funds that we talk about, or it's section eight or whatever the case is. Those are all tools. That's all they are. Um, and they're only as good as the, as the hand that is wielding that tool. Right. It's, they're only as good as that, both on both sides, the one who is administrating it and the one that's receiving it. Mm-hmm. And if we can build the, build the relationship in that and guide it and walk through it, which I think there's a lot happening that's a very positive, positive side with that, that we're being a part of, that... Now we're seeing social services. We've got case management for our for those that we're helping get into home ownership. We have case management in our shelters where they're not just sitting there and okay, you got evicted. Well, let's figure out why. You know, maybe you get a bad landlord. You know, we we understand that, and it was nothing that you did on your own. But 
in in many cases it's you know maybe you didn't handle the responsibility of renting an apartment on your own and you didn't pay your rent or right. you you know you violated the rules or whatever the case is housing is housing's a big responsibility for people home ownership is a massive massive responsibility the idea that it's the american dream is i don't agree with that everybody should own their own home it's, you know, a picket fence in front of every house, uh, a chicken in every pot, and a car in every driveway. That's that's a bad, bad idea of what the American dream is. Not everybody should own a home, but everybody should have, be responsible enough that if they ever have the opportunity, they're able to handle it. Right. And that's what we come in. That's where we come in, and that's the that's the surviving to thriving. So the housing market component is just a tool to use that we can be able to then move on and bring in the kind of person that uh, that can be responsible for that. Awesome, awesome. When we go back to the development that took place or that has taken place and the land that's pretty much adjacent to the church. So, yes. I mean, we go back, first we got the Douglas Point Apartments. Those, yes. those were put up and kind of most recently, uh, Silver Birch. Yes. Silver Birch was a assisted living facility and I think you all sold them the land yes. for them. Yeah, we were to part of Silver that. Birch. Yeah, mm -hmm. Silver Birch is a awesome, awesome facility. I actually had a family member that actually lived in Silver Birch. Oh wow. I had a, my, one of my uncles, he just recently passed, but he he actually lived in Silver Birch for about two years. Okay. So it was it was it was a great experience, a great facility. And senior housing right now is a big need. It's a big affordable seat senior housing. Yeah. Because you have a lot of senior facilities, but they're so expensive yeah. and not yeah. all of your seniors can afford it, but right. the affordable ones, they, they stay full. Yeah. They stay full. Yeah. But in the middle though, so we started, Douglas Point was kind of in the beginning yeah. and then you had Silver Birch toward the end, but right in the middle, right in the middle. <laughs> you had the townhomes, yes. the townhomes and explain how that, and when you guys kind of started with the townhomes and what the mindset of, okay. of that was. Sure. Sure. So at this point now, we had been partnered with the group that built Douglas Point, all, mm -hmm. the, all the apartments. And part of the deal with all of that was to build for sale housing in the gotcha. middle, which was the townhomes and, and all of those. And they were really nice. But in the middle of that, they, it just didn't seem like they were able to move them. And so they started moving them more toward renting and they, and they didn't finish off the pro the whole deal. And me, for for intermission and us being a part of the original development of Douglas Point, because we were the nonprofit that came in. One of the things I felt very convicted of is that we should still be faithful to finishing out the villas, the townhomes, and all of that. And so through the course of it, we would I would go to the owners of the of the apartments and the owners of all of it and just say, hey, listen, if you're ever, you know, if you want to just sell those to us, we can, we'll take them and we'll, we'll make a, you know, finish them off and finish everything out. And it, it ultimately they did. And so we, we purchased everything, um, from is basically for what they owed on it. The original owners, they, they got, got out and went into a different area of the country doing different development things. And so we just stayed and then we purchased the original eight townhomes. And through the, through the next few years, we built another pair of villas on there and continued on with that and used it for help for people to get into home ownership, but mainly as part of a sustainable income for the nonprofit organization to help continue helping people on the social services side in the, in, in the different areas like that. And now we're in the process of building 19 more uh, townhome units through that. And, and that's again, designed to help people be, get into affordable housing as well as sustainable income for the nonprofit organization to be able to continue doing what we're doing. Gotcha. Don't want to gloss over the fact though, that all of this happened when they started building the townhomes, things like that, the year of 2008. Yes. <laughs> but it yeah. happened during that. The year 2008 yeah. didn't happen during all that. So we explain, just kind of say, you know, how that affected the original plan. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. how did you have to make some audibles, some adjustments? Yeah. Some... So, so again, that goes back to the who, not the how, <laughs> because sometimes when you're in this market or you're in this kind of program, 
ministry, vision, whatever, the how goes out the window. And I think that we all understand that with the pandemic, yeah. you know, that, so you know, I'll go right back to 2008 in a minute, but let's face it, nothing's the same. Yeah. We all thought we we're going to be going back, you know, okay, we have a few little, you know, we've got this COVID-19, it's kind of like a flu thing we're going out and over a million people are dead now. And, and now we're trying to get back to what it was. Well, we're never going back, you know, so the how is subjective, <clears throat> but sometimes what happens is, is you're, you're partnered with, or you get with a group of people that will become, will become the how, mm -hmm. that the who becomes the how. And so what happened with us is we, we got, I think, 12, 12 paired villa units. So there was six, six of them, so there were about 12 of them there that we were built. And they were all designed for home ownership. And it was not designed to be rental or anything. And so we were in the process of moving and, and they were selling and several of them were selling and it was going great. And then all of a sudden, literally at one of the closings of one of our units, they were ready to sign the papers and everything else. And the bank called it, it shut down that closing in 2008. And wow. those people ended up allowed to move in, but they moved in from a perspective of just leasing the place and renting. And they rented that place for from 2008 till about 2018 that was that stopped that kind of project i mean on it's i mean it stopped it dead on a dime it we weren't able to do any kind of any kind of building or anything everything was shut down at 2008 the the financial package the way that it was written did not give any room to tra transition those into permanent financing and to allow uh, for leasing or renting or anything else, the bank called in our note. Hmm. And I, and so the food that we were with, our partners that we were with it, there was one of the gentlemen that had deep enough pockets that he just, he says, I will assume it all. And he used his own cash to get the bank out of the way and he just became that. And so for a man, sometimes it's a blur, but I would say at least for the next four years till 2012, 12 2015 somewhere right around in there that that just sat and that's the way it sat and the the units that had not sold just became part of the income to pay to pay the gentleman that was part of the team and so so it's interesting because i never really looked at it that way but the who that we had became the how to make this survive all the way through and then through the course of everything then the the building that you were talking about and the land you were talking about silver birch came in and that those those people and the developers came in and said hey we're interested in doing this and they said would you be interested in selling your property or being a part and so we worked all different things out but what that ultimately did is that one that one deal right there gave us the ability to pay everything all the infrastructure loans that we had to build, wow. put in all the utilities, all the, you know, all, all the major infrastructure stuff that had to be in there and a part of a, a, uh, a road that had to go down the middle of the property for access and things like that. All of that was paid wow. uh, by that one sale. And so that put us in a place. And now, now we're back up and running. And out of all of the units that we, that were there, we, we got all of them back and have even purchased a few more that we that we didn't have in the in the beginning. Wow. And I didn't want to gloss over that fact too, because I want people to realize even when you're doing real estate development and things like that from a a truly purpose driven perspective, there are still risks associated with it. There yes, are still there is. challenges, there's still gonna be hurdles that you yeah. have to overcome. But if you stick with it, yeah, and if your your heart is truly in the right place things tend to always kind of work themselves out they do they do it's really interesting because i can remember in 1989 standing there in in what is now what we call our miracle bridge mm -hmm. of over one of our the little retention ponds over there that what none of that was there it was sitting there in the middle of a uh, a tire pile and i brought my wife over and i said i this is what i see i see i see apartments all around. I see homes. I see stuff for unwed mothers. I see stuff for um, people to get into home ownership. I see housing for students. 
for uh, training in helping community and helping in, in the areas of ministry. I mean, I just begin to paint the whole picture that's there now. But when I look at it, I never understood until after that we had built this miracle bridge over this pond that people want to get a miracle or they want to, you know, uh, believe in a miracle and come to one that's literally visual and you can do it. And it was at that place. And I didn't intend for that to happen. Wow. And so, you know, we get after that. But that was, that was 35 years ago. Hmm. So this isn't, you know, this is something that you're like, hey, that's neato. So let's go on and let's go do this. Let's go buy some 50 acres and go put some houses on there and see what happens. It, that's not how it happened. It's from surviving to thriving. It's from proud to core. And it's a process. And had I known back at 23 and 1989 that this was going to be a life call, you know, I... I don't know if I would have done it, but you know, God, God kind of knows what to show you, <laughs> what to show it to you. Right. If that's you know, right. if that makes sense. So you mentioned the nineteen because you do have land left in those townhomes. Yeah, in that townhome development, as so you mentioned, we got about nineteen yeah. um, townhomes that we're planning to develop over there. What what's kind of the the intent or the purpose? What 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 do you plan on using those nineteen townhomes for? So. Two, two reasons. I'm open to using them for whatever turns out and happens, but right. for the first part of it is, is we want to really be able to help people get into that first or second phase of living in a home, right. helping people understand what it means to take care of a home, and, and those that maybe can't, couldn't get in there on their own, be able to help them with rental assistance and things and, and using some of the home funds to, to be able to build those homes and and some of them as well and then the other phase will be again just to bring in for sustainable income and and but as as much as anything i love the idea of being able to build community that's probably if there's anything that i've learned in the old housing thing mm -hmm. is that if we really work work hard at it you can build community in such a way that that uh you, you can't do it any other way because everything happens around the home. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've done in even in our church is that we've started a home church network to where we do church in our homes. And so we're wanting to build a spiritual community in the neighborhood as well as a social community. Uh, back to the, you know, the age where, you know, you had your front porch, you know, right. and every and every evening people are sitting out there and having a, you know, a nice tea or, you know, a Coke, whatever, you know, the kids are playing ball in the front yard or, or whatever the case is might be and in coming in and, and people are just stopping and and having a you know having a conversation you know and building that relation knowing the names of your neighbors knowing the names of their dog or knowing the name of their kids knowing when their birthdays are building that community we live together but we pass each other you know like two ships in a night you know because we're we're so mobile but I think uh, I do sense and see some things changing in this in where we're at now is the walkability of a neighborhood, the 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 safe environment of the neighborhood. When we know our neighbors, we're able to take care of our neighbors, right. type of thing. And I and I think that's something that I'm really seeing come out of that is yes, we want to take housing and use that as a tool to help home ownership. But what good is home ownership if we're still isolated? There needs to be some kind of level of community. So that's something that we really are really trying to develop. Right. Work on. Right. You know, just when I think back to my childhood, I knew everybody on my block. Yeah. And I grew up, I'm an 80s baby, 80s and 90s baby. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I knew everybody on the block. They knew us. They knew our family. We knew each other's family. We looked out for each other. When we went out of town, we didn't have to worry about, you know, mailbox running over with mail. We didn't have to put, we didn't have to go to the post office and put stop work. Our neighbors did that. They, right. <laughs> now it's a crime to touch people's mail. <laughs> I know. It I probably know. was then, but your neighbors still looked out. That's they, right. They saw your mail was overflowing. They came and yeah. took care of it until yeah. you got back. Yeah. You know, but th there's definitely a lack of that now. There, there is. And I think, you know, the, we just moved into a brand new neighborhood and, and our neighbors, we were getting ready to be gone for a, few, uh, a week or so. It wasn't very long. And I just went over to our neighbor and I had a little piece of gold card and I said, this is our, this is our cell numbers and we're going to be gone for a few, you know, for a couple of weeks. You don't really have to do anything at the house. We've taken care of it. We have, our kids are coming over, that kind of stuff to take care of things, but just to let you know. And they looked at us and it was, it was almost as if, wow, you know, that, that's, that, that's 
kind of uncommon. But at the same time, that was something that would, you know, it, it's built camaraderie with us right. and we've only lived there a little over a year. There was an event that happened to me, though, that I really realized that this was my heart for the neighborhood. The original neighborhood that we lived in, in our community, just we lived there for a little over 21 years. And in 2008, again, at that same time, our neighborhood flooded so bad that we had over eight feet of water in our basement. And we could not step out of our main floor on any step outside or inside to our basement so without, without our um, foot being covered with water. And our entire, na- our entire neighborhood, we were known, they listed us as a national disaster. And the National Guard came in. In fact, the National Guard came in and boated us out of our home mm. at one point. There was there was four National Guard in the in this big flat bottom boat, and there was six of us that got at, got in that boat and with whatever we could carry, and we left. And within a couple of days, the water subsided, and I felt like we needed to do something. I had older neighbors. In fact, the reason why the National Guard came to get us out is we were one of the last to leave because I had elderly neighbors on either side of me and across the street. And I, I didn't feel comfortable leaving until I knew they were okay. So when I saw that they left, then that next morning on that Monday morning or a Monday afternoon, we went ahead and got in the boat and left as well. We were out of our house for seven weeks, but m- many people were out of their house for over a year to get this all together. One of the things that I felt very compelled to do was to, oh, to put a relief tent in our front yard and for about three weeks we fed people breakfast lunch and dinner while they were coming in and cleaning up their homes and cleaning up and to that to the day that we left and moved out of that house and moved into where we're at now we still had neighbors that would feel comfortable enough just to walk into our house without even knocking on the door because that we they go back to that but we remember we remember our neighbors losing everything. Some of them, they lost everything. They didn't have flood insurance. Maybe their mortgage was paid off. Mm. And one of the things that I remember, you know, one one gentleman, he was over there and he would never eat. He would have a, maybe a sweet roll or a Danish in the morning when he would come in. But they would start telling stories of what they lost. But it would go into stories that, of the things that they lost, mementos, those kinds of things that they had. They would begin telling the stories of their children or of their, of, you know, what, what the neighborhood was and what the neighborhood can still be. And I really felt like through the course of that, we began, there was a kind of cohesion around our house, but around many others. And to this day, we've got deeply good friends, even wow. though we're out of that. And, and I think that's some of the thing that's hugely important with the, with the neighborhood, because sometimes, I mean, I've got friends all over the world. I've got friends that are way far away, but it was my, it was my neighbors that was able to help me because they're right there. You know, people that were coming in from different neighbors and communities around us. And we were able to marshal a group of people that could come in and help a neighborhood. And But we were right there. All right. All right. Well, and that's what we're here for, to serve. Yes, that's we are. Here for. Here's where we're here. As we start wrapping up, I definitely appreciate your time. This has been awesome. I have the last few questions, last couple questions. All right. You are a senior pastor. I am. So that you are. You can't hide from it. <laughs> I know. So you are a senior pastor. And, and, and I would say that right now the, the the relationship between our church and state is somewhat fractured. Yeah. How important, though, in your journey as far as helping the community, finding purpose and doing housing, how important has it been to establish good working relationships with, with your local government officials? You know, I think uh, it's not only highest priority it's mandatory and i do not mean it from the idea to fight the fight the argument or try to win the debate of separation of church and state we can debate that all we want and go back to the to the letters with thomas jefferson and the baptist church we can do all of that that really does not ever solve anything those debates in my estimation i don't even try to get into that what i feel like is that it the church is the community. The school is the community. It's hard for me to say, okay, that there's a separation from the church and the state. That means then that the church, so what happens if I'm the church and you're the church 
and my wife is the church and your wife is the church and the four of us are going out to dinner and we go out to dinner into a into a restaurant in our community you can't separate that because right. we are the church the building is not the church right. the address is not the church the all of that it's it's the individuals that are in there and there is a term in the new testament that is used for the uh the idea of the church and it was called kubernetes and it's a nautical term and it actually means one that steers the ship or it can also mean the rudder of a ship and what i see and and in in the, those areas that the church was actually called that in the in the new testament in the first in the first century in other words what it was the idea of is that the church is the rudder or the steerage of the community mm -hmm. meaning it brings in the moral fiber it brings in the direction we should go i find it really interesting i've been watching a lot of the town council meetings for the city of hammond and they still open up in prayer and they yeah. still will open up yeah. in prayer and say in the name of jesus guide us lead us as we make decisions for this church that's the church and the community that and, the, and i can't even I, I have a hard time even saying that's the church and the community working together because to me if if you were if nick knowing your faith and knowing where you're at if you were the mayor of east chicago i would say the church is the mayor of east chicago because you're the church we are the bride of christ and that's my theology behind it as my philosophy whatever you want to call it but it becomes that if we if we shift this thing instead of what we're either against or for whatever it's just who we are it's just what we are so that's that's where i i look at it yes it's of utmost importance but i think it needs to come from a place of how we live and not how we talk be the church not do the church <laughs> come on <laughs> so, so now you're going to get preaching i'm not sure that's what this podcast is for <laughs> so last question if somebody's listening yeah they want to impact their community through real estate whether it's it doesn't have to be ground up reconstruction, new construction. Right. It could be taking the dilapidated building. Yes. And wanting to do something for the community for what advice would you give to somebody like that? First of all, foremost, I would say um, get connected with someone that um, is a developer. Um, maybe you are a developer. Then get somebody get with somebody that has a vision like you do. If you are somebody that sees and says, man, I, I really see a, we could get a house and and fix this house up and everything else you know if if anything call us we've been doing it for a long time now i can't we'd have some ideas that we could help you with but get with somebody that knows what you don't if you're the developer side of things and you're the realtor or you're the one that has the land and the buildings and everything then gets with somebody that's got a real heart and a vision to do something on a community level and and partner that way and start start that way and then just make sure you you know the you know it sounds sounds um, maybe a little bit parochial, but know the codes, know the know the know the different ins and outs uh, of all of this. Because if you're not careful, you can get in the middle of a project, and it can cost you hundreds and th of thousands of dollars that shouldn't didn't need to because you just didn't know. So, well, Pastor Callaway, I definitely want to thank you for your your time. This has been awesome. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. Again, this is the Wire Podcast, Wealth and Real Estate Development, where we build wealthy communities, literally, and wealthy families, wealthy individuals through real estate development. Again, I'm your host, Nicholas Smith. Thank you all for listening. Again, I hope that you all would like, share, and subscribe this so we can build an even better audience and make our communities even stronger. So again, Pastor Callaway, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It has been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please share this content with someone else who would benefit from it. I'm looking forward to having you with me on the next episode. Now go out and create some wealth and real estate development.